But they said, like, if you could just sum it up in one sentence, what would the Gospels mean? And she said, what the Gospels mean is to be disturbed by nothing, to let nothing disturb you. What that means for us when we go through any trial is we need to try to put on the lens of thinking like God. You know, why is he allowing this to happen, this struggle that is causing me worry? It can only be because he's going to bring some sort of good out of it. Welcome to Stand Firm Productions. My name is Father Jordan Dosh, priest from the Diocese of Bismarck, and I'm currently serving as the vocation director. It's a strange experience wearing clerics out in public. You know, when you're going from the church or from the school, you're kind of in a Catholic world, but the moment you stand out of that, you know, whether it's the grocery store or a gas station, it's just it's kind of like a shock to the world. You know, they, they see someone in clerics and they know that there's something different. Even if they don't know everything that the Catholic Church stands for, um, it's just kind of shocking. And almost every time, you know, I have great conversations, people come up to me with questions, but obviously the, the most common is that people ask me to, to pray for them. Uh, and it's usually something that they're going through, something that they're worrying about. And I don't think I need to give too many examples, uh, because we all know of certain things that cause us worry, cause us anxiety in the world, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, global, global conflicts with what's happening in the world, whether it's uh, local conflicts, what's happening in our country, um, you know, things that are happening in the church, uh, maybe things that are happening in our families and in our own lives, maybe a sickness or an illness or something. The idea of worry can sometimes make us question God's goodness, right? So it's, it's the most basic question of, you know, if God is so good, then why would he allow this to happen? And our inability to understand why God is allowing this to happen causes us worry. And, and it also causes us to question whether God is actually as good as he is. And it happened a lot, you know, especially around the election season. People are worried uh, whether in this direction or that direction. And it just kind of struck me uh, when I would talk to them. I would ask them, I said, what are you going to do about it? This worry that you have, this concern that you're going through, you know, what is in your control that you can do about it? And when it comes down to it, there's a lot that's out of our control, right? If, let's say we have an illness, you know, maybe there's something that we can do. We can seek medical attention. We can take care of ourselves, but there's still a lot that's out of our control, right? Whether it's uh, things that are happening in the church, there's a lot that's out of my control. Things that are happening in the country, what can I do about it? I, I can be a good citizen. Uh, you know, I can uh, be charitable to my neighbors, help them, you know, be the best people they can be, you know, get involved, do things like that. But there's still a lot that's out of the control that, like, I cannot personally resolve this conflict. And that's hard, and that causes worry in my life. And it's important to be able to see that if there is something that's causing me worry and I can't do anything about it, I can't personally resolve it myself, then for some reason God is allowing that to happen. And as Catholics, we believe that God is allowing that to happen to bring about a greater good, right? I talked about this in my, my previous episode, but I would just like to reiterate this, right? So the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16 Jesus is speaking with the apostles. He asks, who do people say that I am? They come up with a bunch of different examples, and it's Peter who answers it correctly, and he says, you are Christ. You're the, the son of the living God. And because of that, right, the primacy of Peter, we believe that, you know, Jesus gave him the keys to heaven, that he becomes the first pope, and it's the institution of the church that starts off from that, right, that are able to still continue on Jesus' mission even after he ascended to heaven. So right after that moment, right when Peter's riding high because he correctly named who Jesus was, Jesus goes on to prefigure his terrible death, right? That he's going to go through this, this suffering and, and he's going to die. And you can imagine the worry that the apostles had. They've, they've been traveling with Jesus and now they correctly identified and they've accepted in their hearts that Jesus is God. And now he says he's going to die. 
So their rightful response is, you know, we can't let you die. We're not going to let you die. We're going to save you. We're going to protect you. And Jesus looks at Peter after he says, you know, we're not going to let this happen. And he says, get behind me, Satan, right? And it's kind of like just a shot to Peter of thinking that he's trying to do the right thing. And he's worried. And Jesus tells Peter, you are thinking as man does, not as God does. So Peter, in his limited human understanding, could not see how Jesus going through this death was going to be a good thing. But God, in his divine understanding, understood that Jesus going through this death willingly is going to bring about good, such as the resurrection from the dead, right? That he's going to conquer death. He's going to open the gates to paradise for us. And that was the good that was going to come from this difficult struggle. But Peter, in his limited human understanding, could not understand it or see why it was going to be good. What that means for us when we go through any trial is we need to try to put on the lens of thinking like God. You know, why is he allowing this to happen, this struggle that is causing me worry? It can only be because he's going to bring some sort of good out of it. And we know how this ends, right? That, that's kind of the crazy thing. We know how this ends. We know that Jesus wins in the end, right? Him rising from the dead, him conquering death, means that we know what's going to happen. And yet, at times, we can still become worried or kind of anxious of thinking, well, maybe that isn't actually true, right? Because that's what worry is in the end. It's, it's questioning God's goodness. It's, it's questioning the hope, all the promises that he gave us. It's questioning if those are really true. Let me uh, give you another example of this. When I was uh, young, I had the misfortune of choosing a lot of sports teams that, that don't win very often. I've never had the privilege of having a sports team that's won a championship, a national championship, or anything like that. And it happened this one time that uh, the team that I followed, Notre Dame football, made the national championship game. This was, um, the championship game was 2013. And I was studying abroad in Rome at this time. And Rome, you know, six, seven hours ahead, the time change. And this was going to be an evening game, which meant the game would have been at, you know, three or four in the morning. And I had a big final the next day. And I knew that it wouldn't be prudent for me to stay up and watch this game. I knew I had to study. I needed to pass this test. So the way in which I figured it out was I saw that there's this Irish pub right next to my university that was showing the game later in the day. So I kind of thought to myself, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to get some sleep. I'm going to study for this test. I'm going to avoid all uh, technology. I'm not going to see what the score is. I'm going to get some good sleep. I'm going to go take my test. I'm going to do well. And then after the test, I'm going to go watch the game at the pub even though it's hours later, I don't know the outcome, and I'm going to watch it as if it was in real time. And this happened, you know, so I did that, studied, went to bed, got some great sleep, woke up. The first thing that happened, my friend was outside my door, and he said, man, Notre Dame got crushed last night. And he just, I'm just like, come on. Man. I couldn't even, like, step out of my room. I couldn't even, you know. So, you know, I go take my test, all defeated, and I uh, did well on the test. And I still went to the pub to watch the game, even though I knew how it was going to end. And hopefully you're able to see how this analogy works. It would be better if the analogy was, you know, in the positive sense, such as like Notre Dame won. But you know that I watched that game. And there were times in that game in which like Notre Dame got a touchdown or they got a first down. And I actually like, had some like hope in me. I'm like, well, maybe they're actually going to pull this off. But then I'm like, no, I know how this ends. I know they lose. I know they get crushed. That's what happens. And for us, in the game of life, we know how this ends. We know that Jesus wins in the end. And any worry that we have, any concern, is just like me watching that football game, thinking that somehow the ending is going to be different than what I already know to be true. That Jesus wins in the end. That should be the most convincing thing for us whenever we face any sort of illness or trouble. Because we know that if Jesus wins, and I can't understand why this is happening, that he's doing it to bring out some sort of goodness for my own personal salvation. And the thing that's in my control is to continue to be faithful in those moments that are hard. Right? That, that's the only thing that I can have. Because if we try to 
think about it too much and we question God's goodness, there's, there's a lot of bitterness and resentment that can seek in and that divides us from God. But if we trust in his promises, we know that they're true, we're able to get that heaven, right? We're able to get that reward. One last example just to tie it together. I was on retreat a couple years ago and uh, my spiritual director, right when we started, uh, suggested that I read this book while I'm on retreat. And it was a book that I already read. Uh, it was a book that I already owned. And, and I own enough books. I, d- I didn't want to buy another book, especially one that I already read. And, and I already kind of had a, an idea on, in my mind of like how I'm about to go on this retreat and the books that I'm going to read. And, and I didn't want to start by reading a book that I already read. And uh, I expressed those concerns. They understood them. And they said, that's fine, but you should still read it. The book was called I Believe in Love. It's a beautiful book. I encourage you all to read it. And uh, in there, they they just have a a simple line. And this didn't strike me the first time I read the book, but, you know, because of the situation of being on retreat, what it was like, uh, it hit differently in that moment. And and it was just this little line that kind of stuck with me that was really the grace for for the whole retreat. They were asking St. Therese to sum up the gospel you know, and, and, and the way in which she would put it into action is to do the small things with great love. But they said, like, if you could just sum it up in one sentence, what would the Gospels mean? And she said, what the Gospels mean is to be disturbed by nothing, to let nothing disturb you, that that's what the promises of the Gospel are. And as I was just sitting there praying with it, and it just kind of struck me that you know, every saint is basically saying the same thing, whether it's John Paul II, you know, proclaiming, be not afraid, which we hear in scripture often. You know, Teresa of Avila has a beautiful quote of, you know, let nothing disturb you, let nothing frighten you. All things pass, God never changes. You see that like all these like catch lines from the saints are all the same thing. And to basically sum it down, it is that throughout our lives, we're going to face a lot of reasons that are going to make us question our faith. We're going to face a lot of problems, a lot of difficulties that are going to make us question whether those promises of God are actually true. And if what St. Therese says is correct, that the gospel has these promises, that Jesus rose from the dead to be able to confirm those promises, then she's just saying, don't let those troubles disturb you, right? Let nothing disturb you. God is peace, right? He's joy, he's love, He's happiness, he's contentment, he's consolation. And throughout life, life, we're going to face different things that are going to make us question that. And we need to stand firm, right, like that, stand firm, on the promises of God, right, that these are true, that he is good. So whenever we face that worry, we need to be able to see, like, can I do something about this? Is this because uh, maybe my own sin, maybe a shortcoming on my part, Uh, that that I can correct, that I can improve on? Or is this something out of my control that maybe God is drawing forth goodness in? Even though it may seem like the world is going backwards instead of forwards, we know that the promises of God don't change. And it's my job to be able to connect to those, to always choose those, to never despair, to never become bitter, to always trust and love God. And that's my prayer for you. It's a prayer that I try to remind myself of often. I'd like to thank you for watching Stand Firm. Uh, these guys are doing great work. If you have any questions, uh, please let us know. God bless.